Dude, so it's winner take all this weekend in Vegas. And I think for the top three, you better have Lady Luck on your side heading into Sin City. And uh, whoever the winner is might have a fun night on the town with a million dollar check in their pocket. Yeah, I, I'm loving the triple points. And just it kind of spreads out the odds for the top three riders that are there. And um, it's coming down to what, like you said, winner takes all. Well, stick around to the end of the video to see who we think will be the 2024 Super Motocross World Champion for the 450 class, because we're going to make our title predictions and picks. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited because I got my pick locked in. I don't know about you, but we'll save it to the end of the show. Let's start with this week's winner, a new winner, Hunter Lawrence. Nice way to cap off his rookie year. Granted, he still has one to go and a title on the line heading into the final round of the Super Motocross World Championship. Mm -hmm. But I think for Hunter, I was just really impressed to see him ride the way we know he can ride in Moto1 because we've seen him challenge Jet. We've seen him challenge Eli, Sexton, these other riders in the 450 class. But we haven't seen him necessarily take them all the way down to the wire and beat them. And this yeah. weekend, he really took it to both Eli Tomac and his younger brother, Jet Lawrence. Yeah, you're right, man. It seemed like Jet would always get the edge on his older brother, Hunter. And for a while, it's just starting to really make me think that was always going to be that way. And maybe that would have played out the same. However, we had an awesome wild carders weekend of our man, Eli Tomac. I think he was sitting around fifth place or sixth, maybe. And then he just started slowly working his way up front. And then he got into third and I was thinking he's not going to close down this four, five second gap on the Lawrence bros. And I think within two laps, he had cut down the gap. At this point, I'm standing. I'm no longer sitting on my couch. Because I'm thinking like, oh my God, Eli Tomac, the guy that got a championship robbed from him due to his ankle injury and hasn't maybe gotten quite the finishers that he deserves, is now tracking down the two top guys in her class. Mm -hmm. And then what do you know? Jet makes a mistake and Eli jumps right on it and gets around him. Yeah. I was like... Fucking how cool is this? Yeah. I was hoping to get Hunter, but it was really cool to see Hunter actually fend them both off and go, you guys are your thing. I'm going to stay out front. You two battle. And I want to say Hunter is almost mistakeless, that moto. He may have made a few mistakes, but none of them stood out on the level of what Jet or Eli did that did not allow them to catch Hunter or even put a pass on him for first. So way to go to Hunter for one, holding your line, not making mistakes and letting the race behind you just kind of play out. Hunter Lawrence was the best guy. He made the least amount of mistakes to your point, And he had the speed to fend off both the Jet Lawrence and Eli Tomac. Granted, you could argue that Eli Tomac and Jet Lawrence were faster at different points in the moto, which I do agree with. But Hunter mm -hmm. Lawrence, like I said, from the gate drop to the checkered flag was the best guy. And it was cool to see him stand up on the top step of the podium, not only for the moto, but also the overall, just because he came so close at so many different points during the pro motocross season that it was like, mm -hmm. we know it's gonna come, but it's a matter of just when. And I'm stoked to see him get that in his rookie season, just because he's not going, having to sit all off season being like, dude, I didn't get the job done. I have so much pressure on me now, my sophomore season to go out and get this done. But now he can kind of just be like, sweet, I got that checked off the box list and I can move on to the next one. Hats off to Hunter Lawrence because he rode great. Let's touch on Eli Tomac though, just yeah. because his line in the sand was amazing. Scoring that, that uh, inside up early and he was able to make a couple marquee passes in that spot. And I feel like that was just his spot. And other riders did pick up on that. 250 or 450 class. Is that where he tape. double out at the very end of the sand section? Either double or triple out onto the start straight. Okay. But yeah, his line there was just I'm freaking real. When he did that the first time, I was just like, oh my gosh, like this is just vintage Eli Tomac. His turn kind of reminded me of his turn onto the start tree of Millville in 2022. Um, if you go on YouTube, I'm sure you can find it. If you type in Millville 450 Moto 2 2022, you can see Eli Tomac with the scoop tire just holding the YZ 450F on the limiter and power sliding his way just across the start straight. And it was kind of similar seeing him exit that sand section, heading towards that double or triple, um, depending on how far you want to go. And uh, that's the first thing I thought of. And I was like, man, this is Eli, this is vintage Eli Tomac. There's a really cool moment of him and Jet racing each other. Jet went outside, Eli took the inside and it put him in, right into a double. And uh, Eli got wheel spin and came up pretty short. 
but he revved the bike so that way he cased it and then just rode it out into a wheelie afterwards. It was so fucking sick because it was a sense of he knew he made a mistake. Jet was going to get a better drive off the landing and Eli was able to just figure out, okay, let's case this, bounce, and then get the rear tire right back on the ground and fucking wheelie this thing. That just shows you the skill that these guys have. In that scenario, I would have freaked out, panic revved, and probably bounced and got yarded off the bike. Instead, he was able to turn it into what looked like something Axel Hodges would do. <laughs> and it seemed like he's having fun based on the way he's riding. And that's a dangerous Eli coming into the Supercross season. I'm hoping that just everything goes great the next round and the next off season, and that he rolls into a one, just healthy, fit, in shape and the bike is just to his liking there's no there's nothing on the table that he's not happy about well let's move on to chase sexton who was yes. second overall in the day and i just was puzzled watching moto one just because i'm like okay cool like he's gonna latch mm -hmm. on to these guys and didn't quite able wasn't quite able to do that no he got gapped we tend to see that with chase sometimes he either has one bad moto which is typically moto one bad in the sense of <laughs> chase's expectations are to win and when you get fourth that's not winning mm -hmm. not saying he rode bad necessarily but quite yeah. a bit off from what he wants to get i think we call it bad because he does that and then he usually wins moto too which is exactly so what he did over the like, weekend so we look at it, i think in comparison to a second moto and yep. go but yeah okay sorry but yeah and then he goes out and just has lethal speed he was just like a bat out of hell in moto 2 mm -hmm. and i'm just like what happened during motos and they're saying on the broadcast that they didn't touch the bike but the bike's been quite a hot topic with red bull ktm factory racing and chase sexton just because mm -hmm. i mean you've covered it before wasn't happy during supercross got the motocross starting started to get a lot more comfortable and happy with the bike obviously he was able to wrap up that 450 pro motocross championship now that we're back on more of a supercross style track all of a sudden, he's not so happy with the bike anymore. No. So I'm starting to think of what could they possibly do to get him more comfortable. You and I both saw a great interview posted by Vital MX with Chase Sexton. Um, I, we think their website might be down because we're having a hard time finding the video at the moment. But I'm sure Michael will get it posted back up. But it's just a very authentic kind of just feedback from Chase. And, you know, it's one thing to listen to rider feedback, but the dude just went out and won. So... Mm -hmm. I'm sure the bike can be better, but is it that bad? Like just based on the interview, it sounded like the bike was terrible and it's not even rideable. But then to watch him ride it the way he did, again, not taking away, I'm sure it can be made better, but I'm, a, I'm hard pressed to think it's that bad. Unless maybe Chase is in the free time, I was gone out and maybe ran a different brand bike in the past lately and rode a bike and went, wow, this one works way better than my bike, but probably not because I'd be out of contract and he's in his contract for another year. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, man, because Moto 1, I would think he's going to do the same performance in Moto 2, but that's not what happened. Do you think it's because that Eli got a bad start and the Lawrence Bros didn't have good starts or and that he started up front, or would it not have mattered? He could have started in the top five and still worked his way forward. It's hard to figure out the puzzle of Chase yeah. Sexton because we've seen him... I mean, we saw the dude go from last to first. Right. So it's not like he can't pass... Mm -hmm. and make his way through the pack we've seen that that's obviously evident and obviously he can lead a race wire to wire so yeah. i just don't know where i fall on the scale they didn't really make time up on him after the lawrence bros yeah. got in and second he like, just yarded he, everyone yeah so i just i'm so i'm honestly just speechless i have no idea what it is but i do think james stewart is kind of in the right direction and saying that chase Saxon is a different rider out front when he's out front i mean he's it's hard to catch him sometimes. I, the dude is just gone. Mm -hmm. And no one was really just on his level in Moto2. But I would almost take it a step further and say, I think he's a different rider when he's ahead of Jet Lawrence. I see. Yeah. Well, I mean, if the bike is, if he's unhappy with the bike as, as he says he is, then what a great bad position to be in for KTM and Chase. If the bike's that bad, but you can still go out and win on the damn thing, then it only gets better from here. Yeah. Imagine if the bike is good like yeah so <laughs> right. in that case chase is only only better get better once the bike gets improved and ktm slash wp has all the resources at their expense to do that mm -hmm. so whether they make it happen by this weekend in vegas or by a1 
they're going to have improvements by then. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that leads to Chase continuing to get better as a rider, then fuck, oh my God. It's just getting insane with how good these guys are getting. After, so after Eli, it's Cooper Webb, then Ken Roxon, Aaron Pessinger, Jason Anderson, Dylan Ferrandez. It's stacked. <laughs> Anybody that goes to the line thinking they can win, you are a confident man. Because mm -hmm. those are some heavy hitters to race against. And yeah. I feel so lucky we get to sit down and watch it. Yeah. Well, speaking of watching, we will be glued to the TV this weekend watching the finale from the Super Motocross World Championship. But before we end the video, we have to make our title predictions. It is winner take all between Hunter Lawrence, the younger brother Jet Lawrence, and Chase Sexton. So who is your pick for, I guess, not only just the overall, but the title? Because whoever takes it is going to take the title home with them. Part of me wants to go Jet. He's been in this position before, and we've seen him come out on top. But we've seen the same with Eli, and we've seen the same with Chase. Part of me thinks Hunter, for some reason, is going to play this really smart and find himself in the right spot and either not get taken out or take somebody else out and himself out. Mm -hmm. So I think Hunter's just going to be, one, competitive with his lap times. He'll have a good practice, and he'll get a good start. And somehow that's just going to all work in his favor to get him the overall moto win. Does that mean he goes 1-1? I don't know, but I'm going to go with Hunter. Nice. I like it. I'm going to go with Jet Lawrence, the younger brother. Okay. I just think, I mean, he's the reigning, defending Super Motocross World Champion. He's been in this position before, like you have said. I think back to last year when it came down to the last few laps between him and Ken Roxon, and he was able to hold off Kenny. And uh, the dude just, I mean, we've talked about in other JBI race recaps, the dude can handle pressure. So it's not like he succumbs to, to pressure when it's on. And I just think he is, at the moment, he is the most well-rounded rider, meaning he's got great starts, he's got great speed. It seems like he's pretty happy with the 2025 CRF 450R. I just think that he's in the right spot for this. Granted, he's not necessarily in the points lead. It's his brother Hunter who is in first with Chase Sexton just one point behind him, but it's almost at the, with triple points being on the line at the finale, it's almost like, who gives a damn? Like it, you're essentially tied yeah. because you just gotta go out and win. So I think for Jet Lawrence, it, he's just gonna lay it all out on the line. Drop your title pick down below and uh, let us know if you wanna see some other JBI content on our YouTube channel. We post not only race recaps, but we are I almost said balls deep, but I'm just gonna go ahead and say it balls deep For in sure. chassis versus suspension right now. And uh, we have many other videos, whether it's tech tips or JBI spec videos up on the Ride JBI YouTube channel. So check those out if you haven't already. Appreciate you guys watching and we will see you guys in the next one.